Uh, okay, students. So we continue from uh, the third lecture. This is the fourth lecture. So we continue from our whatever we learned last time. Only thing before we get into the discussion, I would like to tell you about some books that you would like to read uh, in covering these parts. Apart from that, I will send you a, send you several PDFs for thermodynamic derivations, etc. But uh, for the moment, uh, I would suggest to you several books that you should consult. One is Igneous and Metamorphic Petrology by Philpotts and Ague. Igneous and Metamorphic Petrology by Philpotts and Ague. Then you have this book, Inorganic Geochemistry by Henderson, which you should consult. And regarding the materials that I'm presenting now, you should refer to a book, refer to a book called Mineral Physics by Fatness. Other books I will refer to you from time to time, but at the moment, I suggest that you start with a book on Mineral Physics by Putnis and P-U-T-N-I-S, and that would be very good because many of the things that I'm talking about would be covered in that book, although not in one chapter, but you have to look through the book. It's a good idea to look through a book and find out where the material comes from. Right now. But I will also send to you PDFs from time to time where your have dynamic derivations. You see, it's a very small board and it's very difficult to do much of the thermodynamic derivation on this board because every equation, second equation, I have to erase and that makes it more, more clumsy. So I will give you the more relevant equation and its derivation. You can see it from the PDFs. I hope you will agree to it. Uh, right now we have, a, we have this diagram, which was the last diagram in the last lecture three. Uh, we were talking about orthoperoxin or orthorhombic pyroxins, essentially containing MgFeSiO3 and nothing else. Or MG or MGFE whole twice Si2O6, which means that you have two octahedral sites, MG2, MGFE whole twice, two octahedral sites, two tetrahedral sites for silicon uh, in the crystal structure. And uh, this tells you the situation, both are octahedral coordination, where a single metal ion, magnesium or iron, is surrounded by six oxygen atoms where you can see the metal oxygen distances here have a smaller spread as opposed to this one which is a very very large spread. So M2 site is a larger site and M1 site is a smaller site. And you also know that if you're talking of magnesium and iron, magnesium with an ionic radius is 0 0.66 and iron with an ionic radius of 0.74, close enough, but there is a difference between the ionic radius of magnesium iron on one hand and between M1 and M2 side where they occupy on the other hand. Now this makes an interesting story. So before we go into the actual diagram, uh, actual discussion, uh, a few points I would like to mention. In, uh, for clarifying what you are going to do. Uh, yes, another point. Remember the octahedral coordination. You have this type of a situation. We'll have it there. This type of a situation where you have a metal metal ion at the center and you're surrounded by six oxygen atoms. Uh, like two tetrahedrons sandwiched together. So this is the octahedral position and here you see a projection of the six oxygen planes. If you want to look at it in the more, you can look through the internet. There are very wonderful sites which tell you about this very famous operation of M1 and M2 site. Remember, M2, M2 site was located between the bases of the opposing tetrahedron and M1 site was located at the abysses of the adjacent tetrahedron.
So we have a situation where you have a smaller M1 site and you have a larger M2 site. Both contain magnesium and iron and I don't even know whether you can see what I'm writing. I will try some other pens. Magnesium iron and magnesium iron. Now, when we do this, we can calculate something called XMG, which is equal to MG divided by MG plus F. Right? And if you would, it's very easy. XFE would be equal to 1 minus XMG. This you all know, but just for the heck. Now, we can also by this, if you take this and this as separate entities, we will have XMG M1 and XFE M1. And here we will have XMG M2 and here we will have XFE M2. There is also another thing which is XMG OPX that means and XFE OPX. These are two other terms. This means the mole fraction of Mg in the entire pyroxyl and XFE in the entire of the pyroxyl. And here, this superscript would indicate it is the mole fraction of magnesium in M2 side, and here XMG M1 is the mole fraction of M1 side. And you can have several possibilities out of it. And you can you you can have this possibility. Mg divided by Fe in M1 side equal to Mg by Fe in M2 side is equal to Mg by Fe in OPX. Or you could have a situation where Mg by Fe in M1 side is not equal to Mg by Fe in the M2 side and is not equal to Mg by Fe in OPX. What is the difference? And that's important. If I write this expression, it means that the distribution of magnesium and iron in other peroxin, M1 and M2. Both the sides are the same. Which means that there is a random distribution of magnesium and iron in proportion to the availability of magnesium and iron in orthoperoxin. This is called random on-site mixing. So there is a mixing between magnesium and iron, magnesium and iron, but this is not controlled by the different shapes of the M1 and M2 sites. And they are not, of course, they are, they are equal to the Mg and the Peroxide. This one, on the other hand, means that now the magnesium by iron distribution in the M1 and M2 sites are not the same as in Mg by Fe in orthoperoxide. That means their distribution is controlled by something else. Right? So you have random distribution, random on-site distribution of magnesium and iron, and this is non-random, or it is called ordering. Magnesium and iron are between the M1 and M2 sites at different ratios. And these ratios obviously cannot be equal to the total magnesium by iron in the orthoromic in the orthoromic peroxides. Okay? So starting with this, uh, we move on to the next point.
There have been many experiments. There have been many experiments on magnesium by iron distribution in orthoperoxin. I will send you some references, but people have worked on them since 1967. They, they, have, they have been worked on for a very long time, even uh, I remember the last one was possibly years of gone, but the, whatever it is, their experimental data. What is the experimental data? What they did? They took all the experiments were done at one bar pressure. All the experiments were done at one bar pressure, meaning atmospheric pressure. So, pressure effect is neglected. It, but the experiments were done over a large temperature range varying between 500 degrees centigrade, which is there is a little ambiguity there, say 600 degrees centigrade to about 1200 degrees centigrade. A difference of 600 degrees centigrade. So, say for example, at a particular temperature, just to give you an example, at a particular temperature, say 800 degrees centigrade, you take an orthopyroxene, just remember what I'm writing, with XFE value at 0 0.51, say. So you have an experiment where you have 800 degrees centigrade and you took a synthesized pyroxene which has an XFE value 0 0.5 and you would like to determine XFE in the M1 side and XFE in the M2 side. This was done using Mossbauer spectroscopy which allows you to calculate how much iron by magnesium is there in the two different structural sites of orthobiosis. Right? And it will give you some other values. Remember these values if you take it, this will be a value intermediate between this. So now what you get, there is a value for this and there is a value for this. And we expect the values will not be different because the site sizes are different and magnesium by iron is different, the ionic radius of it is different. And then again at another 800 degrees centigrade, you take another octoperoxin, say 0 0.67, and you again find out XFE by XFE ratio. And at the same temperature, 800 degrees centigrade, you take off the peroxide to the 0.86 and you find out the XFE by M2 and XFE by M2. So you carry out series of experiments of 800 degrees centigrade, 600 degrees centigrade, 700 degrees centigrade, 900 degrees centigrade, 1000 degrees centigrade, 1200 degrees centigrade, and at each temperature, you will have a range of points. Right? So you will know the composition of the XFE objects. You will, through using mass power spectroscopy, be able to find out what is the ratio of XFE M1 and XFE M2. Now for our, for our discussions in the MTech class, there is, let us assume, that there is no major discordance of the experiment done by different people. Let's say there is no discordance. Whatever subtle discordances are there is beyond the scope of this class. But let's say that they overall agree. If you do that, so you will have uh, experimental data of XFEM1, XFEM2, several of them at 800, 900, 1000, 1200 and it goes on and on. What, are the, what does the result show? And this is very, very interesting. Let me plot
So that is what we plot. X F E M1 in the horizontal axis, X F E M2 in the vertical axis. And the values of course can't vary, has to vary between 0 and 1. And this is the 45 degree slope. Uh, This is the line with the 45 degree slope. Along the line, XFE M1 is equal to XFE M2. Along the line, XFE M1 is equal to XFE M2. Which means, say you have 0.6. My diagram, if my drawing is wrong, it's 0.6. So that would be random on side distribution. XFEM1 is equal to XFEM2 essentially means Fe by Mg in M1 side is equal to Fe by Mg in M2 side is equal to Fe by Mg in X. So this is that line XFE is equal to XFE. Fine enough. But what does the experiment show? Say for example, we take the data at 600 degrees centigrade. Say this is the data at 600 degrees centigrade. If you go to 800 degree centigrade, I'm only drawing a few lines. It's 800 degree centigrade. This would be 600 degree centigrade. This would be 800 degree centigrade. And this would be here, say, 1000 degree centigrade. Let's say this is the experimental. We got it here, say this is 1000 degree, 800 degree, there are also certain points, I'm not drawing them here, it's impossible for me to draw it, and uh, there's the domestic lines drawn to this, and so these are the experimental point through which these lines are drawn, it's not easy, these lines are not domestic lines, some of these lines are essentially thermodynamic equations of, derived from the equations of state which satisfy these lines. But for the experimental data, before we go into any amount of thermodynamics, what we see here is very interesting. You can see that all the curves, 600, 800, 1000, lie on this side of the 1 is to 1 line. Which means to say that if you take, say, any value Say XFEM 1.2. So this is the value for XFEM 1.2. Now you see here, at 600 degrees, this is the value of XFEM 2. At 800 degrees, this is the value for XFEM 2. And at 1000 degrees, this value is like this. So what does it mean? That if you do this experiment, then XFE by M2 is larger. That's the first point. XFE M2 is larger than XFE M1 at almost all temperatures. Which means to say that since iron and magnesium are both divalent, there is no charge difference. FE tends to be more ordered or if he tends to be accommodated more if he is the larger ionic areas tends to be accommodated more in the larger M2 side. It's not that magnesium does not go but iron prefers that side more than magnesium. 
at lower temperature at 600 degree centigrade the the partitioning of iron is stronger in the m2 site that have you understood so as you have a lower temperature more fe goes into the metal salts but if you increase the temperature then you see the xfe m2 value at this point here xfe m2 at high temperatures is close to xfe m1 so this is a major change at low temperatures xfe m2 is much greater than xfe m1 if you go down to higher and higher temperatures then you have xfe m2 is almost equal to xfe m1 this is the same logic put forward why does this happen first we know that there are several points one point is i repeat one point is fe prefers the m2 site more than mg fe prefers the larger m2 site than mg fe having higher ionic rates this tendency to order or partition more into m2 is high at low temperature and is the preference is low at high temperature point number 3 at the highest temperature xfe m2 is almost equal to xfe m1 question is why question is why in spite of iron and magnesium having different ionic radius and fe and m uh, m1 and m2 having different sizes One temperature, every mg partitioning between the m2, m1, and m2 side becomes more random. The ordering, the ordering becomes very disordered, so that ultimately they lie on this line. You please write down the question, and you better prepare the answer. And a good book to look into it. is the book by patnis as i told you from in mental physics and you try to find out why this happens from a mineralogical point of view not a thermodynamic point of view mineralogical point of view why does this happen now what we learned yesterday was that yes the accommodation of a particular ion in a crystal site is dictated by the array the number of nearest neighbor anions and also the type of packing of the nearest neighbor nearest neighbor ions this we learned this today we learned that that is not so simple there is an effect of other parameters like temperature on this accommodation of iron and magnesium both the m1 and m2 side have six oxygen surrounding the nearest neighbor oxygens yet yet iron magnesium ordering between m1 and m2 sides make sizable changes if you increase the temperature now that is why it is critical for you to find out what is there in that trunk hidden trunk in written on the top is like effect of increasing temperature what is there what happens to the crystal structure of orthopyroxene that you have such type of a convergent equilibrium so i will advise you to go to the book by patnis and try and find out an answer to this if you ask me the answer you see here i have a problem because your tests that i will take are open book tests now if i tell you all the answers then the question is 
What will I be asking? So I'm leaving certain questions, giving you a link to it, giving you an idea of it, and then asking you, okay, could you give me an answer to this? Could you find the answer? You have still time, you have one month to go before your exam, or nearly a month to go before your exam, and there is enough time, and you can go through it and find out the answer. You can discuss it amongst yourself, whatever it is. So please do it. Now, why I chose the topic trust mental interface or trust mental interactions is because you know you have studied mineralogy, you have studied crystallography, you have studied igneous petrology, you have studied metabolic petrology, you have studied geochemistry. Yes. But what you have not as yet possibly appreciated that it's the one and the same story. Petrology, geochemistry, mineralogy, they are all actually all linked. They are all very strongly linked. So what happens is I want you to understand that all these are not disjointed separate entities or stories that are being told. These are actually a very integrated material that comes into the fore when you talk of trust band interactions. Now, I will go into the thermodynamics of this, but I also know that many of you may not know uh, because of different core structures, etc., you may not know the whole thermodynamics part. So it is better that I introduce you to certain things and then I send you the PDF in your Google Classroom for you to back up or, or understand the derivations. It's not possible on this board to do this thermodynamic derivations. But let me give you the essential point. You can do the linking from the PDFs that I will be sending you. So now we will answer this question later on, but before that, before we reach there, I would like to take a detour. I would like to move away and go into a little bit of thermodynamics, just the essentials, and try to get the whole class here into one plane, and from there we will try and move on. Now this is not typical of orthoperoxins, what I am rubbing at the moment. Orthoperoxins are done because they are very simple elements. Such work has also been done on olivine. But as you understand, as you have more lower temperature minerals coming in, their partitioning becomes a major problem. And these are mostly synthetic studies, not on natural samples. Because natural samples, in these samples, you have magnesium, iron and silicon. That's it. It's an NGO, FEO, SIO2 system. It's a very simple system. But natural pyroxins are multi-component systems. So if you deal with natural samples, there are effects of other components coming into play. And sometimes the spectroscopic methods are not very good or not deadly accurate in determining the different interferences. So this is more a synthetic experiment on synthetic samples. But it is true that this can be extended to other minerals as well. So the behaviors that you are studying while I'm teaching with respect to orthopedoxin, the logic stands for another minerals. Now I will send you PDFs of the thermodynamics part, but for the moment we talk of a very simple equation which many of you may have learned in school. And this equation is, you have learned it as G is equal to G0 plus RT ln activity. This is what you have learned, I believe. G is equal to G0 plus RT ln activity. Now, you better be when you are doing thermodynamics, so you are starting to understand thermodynamics or involved in thermodynamics. 
you better make yourself very sure about the definitions and the meanings of this thermodynamic difference. You make yourself very, very sure. Now, just to tell you, just to begin, the term G is called the Gibbs free energy. Why it's free energy? Because it's not, it's not the mechanical free energy. It is the energy that a, in a system has which is not linked to its mechanical aspects. So this is more called a Gibbs free energy. It's a chemical energy that is available for system for reactions. So G is, it, is called the Gibbs free energy. R is called the universal gas constant. So you know the term universal gas constant, obviously. But R has a value of 1.98717. You have to know this terms. 9.717 joules per Kelvin per mole. Or Oh, sorry. Calories. And R can also be written in 8.3143 joules per Kelvin per mole. R is a universal gas constant. It has these values depending on whether you are using calories or whether you are using joules. So nowadays, conventionists we use juice. T is the temperature, and in thermodynamic equations, T is always in kelvins. So you know, degree centigrade is equal to temperature in kelvins plus 271, 3.15. So temperature is always in kelvins. And A, this term, is a one that is notorious. It is not a very easy term to understand. We will dwell on this term a lot in the next lecture. But for this lecture, you can tell that A is called activity. A is called the activity. We will talk about this term later, so I am not emphasizing anything now. It is written, A is written as X into gamma, where X is called the mole fraction. And gamma is called the activity coefficient. It's called the activity coefficient. Activity is a dimensionless number. Dimensionless number. There are no units to activity. Mole fraction also does not have an unit because it's the same number. Grams divided by grams, so it doesn't have a number. And therefore activity coefficient is also a dimensionless quantity. So A, X, gamma are all dimensionless ones. So, if you look at the units here, on the right hand side, on this side, it is R, let's say joules, we, are, we will be talking of joules, so let's consider joules. So, R is equal to joule per Kelvin. Let's take free energy as per mole, per mole. So, R is equal to joule per Kelvin, but it is multiplied by Kelvin. So the term that remains is joules per mole. So the unit of both G's here are joules per mole. It can also be calories per mole if you use this value. Otherwise, we take it as joules per mole. Right? Once again, I repeat. R is joules per mole. T is joules per Kelvin per mole into T, so K and K cancel off, so you have joules per mole. A is a dimensionless quantity activity. So this term in the equation, it should be homogeneous with the units. So G0 has to be 
and G, this G has to be joules per mole. So these are called molar free energy. These are called molar free energy. Now, what is the difference between G and Jizu? Now, if, just before we go back, you know from your from your high school or from your earlier years in physics and chemistry that activity of a pure phase is equal to is equal to one. Activity of a pure phase is equal to 1. And you also know the activity of an impure phase is less than 1. You know this, isn't it? Now, let us see what happens. If we take this value of activity as equal to 1, means what? I have taken a pure phase. So for a pure phase, ln of 1 is equal to 0. So this right hand term is gone. So you have g is equal to g0. Mark my words. g is equal to g0. What is it then? This is the free energy. 0 is for the pure phase. g0 is for the pure phase. Have you understood? If you take A is equal to 1, then this term is equal to 0. That means free energy is equal to the free energy of the pure phase. We will talk about a little more, but for the moment, this is good. But if it's an impure phase, then activity is less than 1. If this is so, then ln of less than 1 decimal would be negative. So this term would be a negative term. So this G and this G0, G then should be smaller than G0. And it is not equal to G0. Have you understood? So if A is less than 1, say a decimal, then this term has to be negative. Because neither temperature nor R is negative. So ln of less than 1 is negative. So this term is negative. Therefore G is less than G0. So what is G0 then? It is the free energy of a pure force. And what is G? Is the free energy of an impure Mark my words. We will go into more complication, but let's go in steps. I know the problems. G is the free energy of an impure phase. G0 is the free energy of the pure phase. In other words, this term think, think about it, is the free energy of impurity. Isn't it? It's the free energy of impurity. Because if G, if G0 is the free energy for the pure phase, and G is the free energy of the impure phase, so this term will be the free energy of impurity, and in fact, uh, this is dimensionless. R into T is what? In terms of unit, joules per mole. Joules per mole is an energy term. Right? So this is the contribution of the impurity, free energy impurity to the system. Did we understand each other? Okay. I think I will make a stop. We will continue in the next lecture from here. Just a little quick recap. I have not gone into the reference state and all that. It will complicate some of you. So first we understand that you have G is equal to G0 plus RT ln A. A is the activity. Activity of a pure phase is equal to 1. 
So if we take a pure phase, then this term is equal to zero. Then free energy is equal to the free energy of the pure phase. So this superscript refers to the purity. And if you have an impure phase, then activity is less than one. That means this term is negative. And that means G is smaller than G0. And what is G then? Is the free energy of the impurity. What does it include? The free energy of the purity minus the free energy of the impurity. Free energy of the purity, G0, plus an algebraic addition of the free energy of impurity given by the term RTLNA. Right? Thank you. We'll continue the next class.